Yeah, hello. Uh, this is a public recording of Cyclodge. It is the visual tools group, and we're having yet another study session about ggplot. And today we will explore ggtrace. ggtrace is this R package for exploring what happens inside ggplot, uh, this package that Kira proposed. And we'll dive into it in a moment. Uh, we are uh, Georgi and Theodo and Ilan and Kira and Tim and Daniel. And I'll share the screen in a moment and we'll explore ggtrace. Um, yeah, we have been chatting for half an hour uh, and, and learning about, about uh, where we are at the moment and about our preferences. And, and we realized the next session might be actually about the grammar of graphics book by Wilkinson. But and today uh, we, we decided it would make sense to, to dive into this part of the ggplot story. So I just installed ggtrace from GitHub uh, using this command I found in the ggtrace, ggtrace docs. And yeah, this is VS Code with R. And, and we're using, we're looking into the docs of ggtrace, the overview vignette, and, and let us see if it's working for us. And then we can dive in further into certain plot and, and so on. So maybe maybe in a moment while I'm I'm exploring that, maybe Kira, you wish to make a comment about anything about ggtrace as you actually explained before we started recording, maybe it is nice to say, to tell it to the people listening. Oh, and we still don't have the ggtrace function. Hmm. Oh. Sure, yeah, yeah. Nothing ever, yeah, nothing ever works if you're if you're being watched. Hmm. So that's the way. Um yeah, I mean there's not a ton to say. I don't yeah, I haven't I haven't um like explored this all that much and I don't really know anything about R, but um yeah, in my like experiments so far trying to implement the grammar graphics enclosure, I um came across this. So yeah, the idea is basically that like ggplot is this um the R version anyways, this library that has these two main like stages. So you take a data set as as we would know it, like a data frame. It has you know a bunch of columns with labels, arbitrary, um, with arbitrary names, <clears throat> and then you transform it into a very standardized format. So you kind of map the aesthetics of a visual graphic onto the data as it's given. So it's like the library it takes you know you basically give it information about like which column goes on like the x-axis, which goes on the y-axis, or if you're doing, you know, you have to give it a coordinate system, you have to tell it um, a bunch of other information about the visual like look of the graphic. And so then you basically, like, like the first part of ggplot is just this data wrangling process of transforming the data set into another type of data set. And then under the hood in R, that is done by this ggbuild thing, library or function. Um, and then there's this, G table library that takes these data sets and draws them as graphics. And so there's this kind of like two-step process. And for implementing this enclosure, so, so far we're mostly focusing on the first part, this like transforming the data set thing from whatever data you're given into a standardized format. And then for now, we can kind of outsource that once you have um, a table that is like generic you can pass that to a number of libraries to to plot and like someday it might make sense or be cool to implement that ourselves um but that's obviously a lot of work and so for now yeah we're just kind of like thinking about it this way so gg trace lets you dive into like very granular um like get a very like a snapshot of the data at different points in this pipeline in this data transformation process um <clears throat> And so it just kind of helps to understand like what's going on behind the scenes in ggplot, like what happens when you like map the aesthetics or apply the scales or apply the um, the labels or whatever. So it's like, it's like just, I find helpful to understand like what's actually going on. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about this. Great, then I'll share the screen again. Thank you. And, and we 
will go through the ggtrace doc, I believe. And yeah, we just say, yes, we are building a grammar of graphics enclosure. And we just realized we have more time to learn why we'll, we are still working on more basic layers of it. So, and so we are also learning. So uh, this is an R markdown document of the ggtrace doc. And, and now the library is working, right? I'm starting the R uh, terminal as they call it, or yeah. And, and, and we have uh, the ggtrace package and yeah. And uh, yeah, so actually let us read the, this, this uh, preface, I think. So, so we have this function ggtrace, which is the main function of the package, right? And um, it, it uh, uh, yeah, actually I'll read that. So this low level function ggtrace is designed for interacting with functions and ggproto method, which is part of the ggplot uh, uh, ecosystem, it allows, it designed for interacting with them from the outside. Yeah, and it allows the user to inject expressions called traces to functions and methods that are evaluated over the execution of ggplot. When triggered, by the evaluation of ggplot, these traces may modify the resulting graphical output, or they may simply log their values to the trace dump for further inspection by the user. Uh, great, yeah, and, and also the, the, there is a great talk by the author of ggtrace, really, really inspiring talk about the, the, the way it approaches and turns this object-oriented ggplot implementation into, into something which is uh, just data, uh, as we like to call it enclosure, or just data frames, as they like to call it in the R community. And right, so briefly, there are three key arguments, method, the, the, the thing we're going to trace, trace steps, where in the body of, of ggplot built right, to inject expressions, and trace expressions, what expressions to inject. So here is like a dummy example. I think we'll go through it. So just a function, just an R function. That's what it does, some arithmetic, right? So, uh, right? Uh, X and Y have defaults and this function adds them. And we see it returns three because that's what the default default gave. And now let us inject something inside, right? So we're gonna inject z equals 10 times z. And we'll, we will do it in the third step, right before we return. So we say, right, let us look into the body of dummy function. You see, that's the, the, the R situation, right? You, you can explore things as data in the R way, so we can ask, Right for the body of dummy function. So actually, let us look it, look into it. So uh, I'm here. In, oh yeah, actually I write it here. So body of dummy function. We, we might be a little bit surprised. And so body of dummy function is just the code basically. And if we look in position three at the code, it is the return. Uh, 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 statement. So I don't know where they start counting, but it turns out that number three is the return statement. And yeah, so we can say, let us inject at position three before the return, this expression multiplying Z by and, and trace it. So now this function, dummy function, is being traced. Let us call it again, and it returns 30. Right? So we're learning. We can trace. Uh, and if you have any comments, please uh, uh, use your voice. I don't see you, so please stop me. Right? And yeah, I think to me it makes sense, I hope. Uh, and, but maybe some of us don't, are not used to R so much, so maybe let us comment about whether anything is strange. And and yeah, so this is like an explanation of what was happening behind the scenes. 
essentially it was creating a function that looks like that with an additional expression in the middle. And, and after we use it once, we can ask, is it trace? And it says false, right? The trace, the, the thing we injected deleted itself. So it's kind of very stateful, uh, a, a very stateful debug tool we're using. And, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, sorry if it, maybe it's uh, not like relevant, but I'm hearing this uh, stateless thing yeah. once in a while. And I have no idea what it means. <laughs> if you oh, could say a word or two about it, I would love that. Right, right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, yes. No. Yeah, yeah, that's a thing closure people say. What do, what do we mean? So I said it is stateful in this case, not stateless. I said, okay, so it's stateful. Yeah, okay. it's like my, my, my mouth is used to it. So it is stateful in the sense that it keeps some state. Yeah state that says is this, this thing being traced uh -huh. and then this okay. may change so uh -huh. as a mutable state mm. then state that change and we closure people since we are functional uh, uh, people we we care about it because it kind of breaks mm. the usual idea of pure functions mm. right? and so we say yeah pragmatically we may have those situations but we just point and say yeah this is stateful this is yeah, did, that, did I say it right, Theodore? Or anybody, sorry. Uh, yeah, so anyway, I think, I think yeah, it is uh, stateful. It has mutable state, right? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank A you. state of whether it's traced or not. Right, mm -hmm. right, okay. right. So in our mind, this thing is, it's, we, is kind of, it might be changing. It, it mm. is okay. It is okay. It is a tool. It is but a, you have to know that it's, that it's there and... What's this and what is the state and like keep track of it or somehow? Or... Yeah, exactly. And you know, a little piece of code, a little piece of code like um, is traced dummy function. This little piece of code, uh, the answer it will give us may change depending of this state we don't see, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, so we are a bit uh, kind of anxious about it maybe. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah, thank you. That that's great. So, so and and that states the uh, I don't know about R, but uh, is it like uh, stored inside the object? Oh, let us try. We can check in R. Uh, things are not so visible by default, but you can often look inside. So let us actually look. Let us try to see if we understand how it is implemented. So we will invoke this again, gg trace of dummy function, and we'll ask again, is it traced? So it says true. And now let, let us look at, into this thing called dummy function. So dummy function. So yeah, it is a function. And you see when I print it, it prints in a special way saying object with tracing code, right? It, it doesn't print like a usual function. And we can look into the attributes. Uh, things like that, which is like metadata enclosure. It is certain things which are attached to this uh, object. And you see it has class that has something special about it. And so, yeah, it is the object that actually changed. And now after we uh, invoke dummy function and we ask again, so we ask, is it traced? No, false. And if you look into the attributes, then that class thing is not there anymore. So yes, the object has changed. It is not any state which is in any other place. Is, we were actually changing this object, which is dummy, dummy function. Yeah, thank you for pointing to that. Um, yeah, great. So all this is just about the infrastructure, but let's see how it relates to ggplot, right? So we bring ggplot and, and right, so, so yeah, so we have an example here. 
And here is a plot. Let us see if we understand what this plot does. And so, yeah, maybe first let us plot it. Uh, right, so let us see. So this is this MPG data set, uh, MPG with this data set of cars. And we create a scatter plot with a dispel and highway as the X and Y and DRV drive as the color. So we see the legend showing those three colors, which are the values of DRV. And right, it is a scatter plot because we use geom point, but we add something, we add position jitter. So we randomize the points a little bit. And then we pass as pass we use geom smooth to kind of pass, to model the points, to pass a line or a curve through them. In this case, a line, because we use LM, which is linear method. Linear model it is a linear model of the points. So it is just a line passing through them. And this is the formula which is, I don't think, oh, right. So the formula is not Y depends on X as usual, but it is, oh yes, it is. So I don't believe this formula was needed, but I think it was there by default. And then we add faceting, facet trap, we facet by year. So, we have uh, those two years. Uh, we have a plot per year, and vars vars uh, I don't remember what that is. Maybe somebody knows here. So that's our plot. Oh, and we added title. So right. So we have a few things, a few parts of the grammar. So that's our plot. Any comments about this? Any anything surprising? I'm always surprised by, by many details, but yeah, maybe something is really not noticeable. Uh, yeah, could me could you maybe elaborate a bit more about this jitter? I don't really get how it, yeah. what it does. Great, thank you. So let us try it without the jitter. So I'll copy this piece of code and here. So here it is without the jitter. So, oh, oh I'm, I'm not sure I'm using this. Yeah, so, uh, so here's the plot without, oh no, it is with the jitter, sorry. I will move the positioning. And, and you see these points, they are over, you see they are kind of covering a certain grid of values and it turns out they repeat certain values. So for example, this value is, oh, I don't know what, like one and a half and 38 or, or seven or something. So this value of, I, I don't know if you see where I'm pointing, but this point might be actually many, uh, points, many rows of our data set, which are repeating at the same position. And we cannot see that. We can not see the multiplicity. So one trick to allow us to see the multiplicity is to randomize all points a little bit. And then we will see there are actually many. We just move them around and then we see, oh, uh, we did have a few points here, a few more here and so on. Does it make sense? Maybe I'll... I'll uh, oh. Well, kind of, yeah, but uh, yeah, I will study that a bit more. Yeah, do you, mean, do you mean, is the method surprising to you or is it not obvious what it does? It's not obvious what it does, but uh, yeah, I think, yeah, that, that makes sense, that makes sense. So uh, let us, uh, let us actually look and see. 
So here is the plot without jitter, and I'm po pointing to those four points. Maybe you see the cursor, four points at the top left. It's two. Right, right. Okay, so there are four, right? Mm -hmm. But are they four? So now I'm adding the jitter, and we see five points not at the same position. So the position was correct without the jitter, but now the position is a bit noisy, but we can see the multiplicity of points. We see there are five, not four, right? And what they did was adding some noise, adding randomness. So two points were at the same position. But uh, does it like take it from, from yeah, does it take it from any kind of a distribution or you specify distribution or like how, how oh, the randomization oh, works? Let, let us check. We, we can imagine it is some uh, uh, normal distribution as one would typically do in this situation, but but actually, it, you know, it is a good good idea to check. So I'm, I'm going to the terminal and ask. Yeah, the... because like I'm mostly working with non-normal distribution. So I always like, this, this is the first question. What distribution do I get? Oh, what, what oh. do you like? Yes. Uh, what, which ones do you? Uh, yeah, I think we were discussing them when we were uh, meeting in our like one-to-one one, one, one session. Like I, right, you, you... Mo mostly I'm getting log normals. Right, right, you, you yeah. Yeah, and, and you're right that it is ne never completely obvious and po poss possibly you're right that we can control it. And, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, but, but we could, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it will be good to explore this. Uh, uh, we can also look at the source. Oh, but the source is in another place. So yeah, maybe another time we we'll explore that. Yeah, thank you for this. And so- Because really, yeah, uh, usually you, you suppose you have a normal distribution, but like my practice is like <laughs> a bit different. I almost never got a normal, uh, almost never get a normal distribution. So that's why I'm yeah, always thinking about these matters, like how it is randomized, what data I'm actually getting, will it like fit, and uh, so on and so on. So that's why. I yeah, ask this question. I I believe in this case, uh, I would like to say it is reasonable to pick a normal distribution, but uh, maybe that's not the topic of today. So we shouldn't uh, kind of. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. But anyway. It was good to maybe bring bring the question up. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So so uh, great. So we are exploring one of these, and the one we're exploring is mostly geom smooth. And and yeah. So so you see. Um, let us let us. Just call GM smooth as they did here and see what it returns. So, uh, right. Here it is my, my closure habit, habit saying, yeah, this thing is printed, but I wish to see it as data, right? Uh, I don't know what this object with this special printing does and, and uh, all right, yeah. So I'm trying to see if like many objects, it can be seen as a simple list. And then for me, it is easier to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. And so you see, uh, Geom smooth is a certain object. Let us check the type of it. The, sorry, the, the thing returned by Geom smooth, the type of it is of 
sorry, I cleaned the, the record. Oh. Uh, yeah. No, doesn't say so much. The class of it is, yeah, a class of a closure object is basically a vector of strings, you know, in, in a way, uh, characterizing certain behaviors, behaviors of it as an object or certain properties, sorry. So it is a few things. Of, one of these things is being a layer. And here we are not surprised. We know all these things we're adding, these are layers, right? And, and GeomSmooth is a layer, but it is, it is also this ggproto object, which is part of this object-oriented system of ggplot and so on. And, and now, if I wish to, to explore inside and see which, which members it has, I turn Daniel, it. Daniel, is, is there a hierarchy between these uh, classes or I don't know what they are, these strings that... Uh... Yeah. Do you mean if one, uh, how it is called? Like, not sure what I mean. It inheres just, uh, from the other. You mean if the one inheres from the other? Mm, yeah, something like that. Or like that uh, there's like a top class and these, I don't know. <laughs> right. So personally, I when I see those object-oriented systems, I try not to learn them, learn them so much because <laughs> intimidating for me and okay. what I know is that the R language it has a few object oriented systems each has its own uh, uh, kind of kind of uh, culture of how one goes about object orientation and possibly some of them do have inheritance but yeah it is very often to understand the 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 class, sorry, very often the class of a thing is, sorry, always, it is always, the class of an object is a vector of strings, and those strings will uh, influence how certain functions would treat this object. So, for example, an mm. object that has a data frame in as one of the strings will probably probably be printed when you call the print function it will be printed by the print data frame function and and so it is a bit like a pattern matching or something or like uh, where you check uh, the the type of the object in in, in other languages like uh, sorry in Pascal. Oh, pattern matching. I, remember, I don't remember the thing in Haskell, sorry. And no, the, the, the pattern matching. So if the object is, or like, for example, in Julia, you have these uh, multiple dispatch. So if the object is, is the type yes. of screen, then do this yes. thing. Right. Yes. Okay, thank you. Multiple dispatch. Right, right. Pattern matching. Yes, thank you. And, and then sometimes, in addition to data frame, you will have another class added, like it is a special data frame for geography. And then it will have another, the, the functions will treat it in a different way. And, and the preference between these classes, I don't remember how it is uh, uh, determined, but yeah, it is, it is simple eventually. And I don't know all about it. So <laughs> yeah, thank you for bringing that. Yeah, we, we, we're learning and, and I, I, I know we, we haven't got to, to actually tracing, but <laughs> in a moment. And yeah, we have half an hour to the official time and I think we can keep going. Yeah, we are closure people surprised by R and learning. And, and great. So we're looking into, the, into this layer returned by the GeomSmooth function. And we're seeing that this layer, you know, I turned it into a list in order to see the members of it. The, 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 actual things we have inside and this uh, has certain things but I'm not sure 
where I should look actually. Um, and yeah, and so actually, um, here, here possibly we should come back to the book, the ggplot book, because then we can kind of recall um, what those layers were about. And I think here it is important. So I'm showing the browser with the book. And, and we'll go to the layers chapter and this one, which is so nice, build the plot layer by layer. And we, we here we learn that a certain fun function call like geom point is actually like creating a layer, but with certain defaults. So for a point, for example, the default geom is point. And the other defaults are boring. But for geom smooth, maybe the defaults are different. Like, I don't know, maybe it has a stat, which is not trivial, right? So, so these are layers. And here we have this geom smooth layer which may have certain defaults. And we're, we're looking for a way to explore them. And, and, and yeah, so maybe I should look and see how the So you say basically that geom point is uh, a layer function with a certain defaults and the uh, like other geoms are, are still like the layer function with different defaults, right? Do I get you right? Right, right, right. It is a shorthand way to to create a layer. Yeah. And so it's like, like a syn syntactic sugar or something. At least that is what the layers chapter is telling us. But maybe maybe a lot is going on. I, I'm not sure because things are, are, you know, looking at the code, it is not as direct as I hoped it would be. But yes, essentially, it is just like creating a layer with certain arguments with certain defaults for these arguments. And yeah, so, so maybe we should go back and follow what the ggtrace tutorial is saying. So it looks into, you know, uh, G, yeah, maybe, maybe let us give it a name, gs, maybe it will be this thing created by geom smooth, or gs is this thing, and then I say gs dollar, and I can pick one of the the fields inside, and then I can ask what is the geom of it. So it had, it is this uh, geom, which is a specific kind of geom, geom smooth. And I ask what is the stat of it? Geom, sorry, gs dollar stat. So here is the stat of it. It is a certain kind of stat, stat smooth, right? And then the way they check it in the tutorial, they say, okay, let us take the stat of geom smooth and ask for the class of it. And it says, yeah, my class is stat smooth and other more obvious things. Yes, I'm stat and so on. So is it making sense? They have a certain way to explore and they are guiding us to learn how to explore these things. So we are learning. We just created a layer, and we can ask this layer, Geom Smooth. Sorry, the layer returned by Geom Smooth. This layer it, does it have any interesting stat? So here we check, and we see. Oh yes, it is a stat called Stat Smooth. So turns out it does compute some statistics, and then we may ask. Oh, we we see that it is a certain way to refer to this stat. Is like this uh, object called stat smooth, which is just this stat. Okay, so we're learning about these objects. And then um, let us learn more. So now we know the stat of the thing, the stat of this layer returned by geom smooth is stat smooth. Now let us explore it. So again, I, I do dollar and tab and I get autocomplete with 
all the fields inside this stat, and I see, oh, it has a certain function, compute group. And, and they propose, oh, let us look into the class of the compute group of this stat. And it says, yeah, it is. I'm sorry. Uh, in that class, Geom Smooth, is it like underscore after a bracket or it's just your linter? Uh, uh, go a bit up the, the previous chunk. The class, yeah, this symbol here before that, yeah, is it underscore? No, no, it's, it's not, it's, it's a lint. Okay, 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 it's, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so yes, the linter is saying, yeah, something here is not right, you shouldn't have a space there. That's what the linter says, right? So, I, yeah, so now it is hopefully satisfied. No, I don't know, no, yeah, never mind, sorry. Oh, never mind. Yeah, so so um, right. So we are learning that we can look into the different parts of a layer, like the stat, and the parts are things that have names, like stat smooth, and and this stat smooth, we can see. Oh, um, it has certain functions, and. Oh, maybe somebody is clicking with the keyboard, so you can mute if you wish, uh, because we're recording. Thanks. And um, oh, I'm sorry, my fault. Oh, thanks. And uh, yeah. Oh, so you were right. There is some inheritance going on there. I didn't know. So yeah, but first, right? Looks like we can ask for get method. I don't know what it is. No idea what it does. Sorry. And we can ask for inheritance and we see, oh, we have certain, certain, uh, we, oh, we see that stat smooth is inheriting certain functions from stat. Like stat smooth is a stat and it means that certain functions would be these by default if they're not overridden by StatSmooth, but StatSmooth does add a few things uh, which are not the default of stat. So there is some inheritance between these mm. methods. Um, between these, between the generic stat and StatSmooth. Uh, any comments so far? Is it good that I'm going uh, through the details? We have 20 more minutes, uh, so I think we can go. But, uh, yeah, that, that, that's actually quite interesting. I did not really dig into all that deeply about all the like object stuff of it. Yeah. So yeah, quite interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't know all that. Yeah, so, so GG trace inspect n. What is that? It, it, takes a, a ggplot as the first argument and a ggprotomod method as the second argument returns the number of times it has been called. Mm. It has been called in the evaluation. So P is the plot we created earlier, the one, the complicated one with the jitter and all that. We are inspecting it in terms of the number of times this one was invoked, and we see all oh, six times, we had six times, six invocations of stat smooth compute group. Or oh, maybe we should look at the plot. Right, we see six lines going here. So possibly for each of these, we did have this invocation, right? It does make sense. And compute group is possibly the way we compute, compute it in the context of a group, each of these subgroups of, of where we, we compute a, a line going through the points. So six seems to make sense, I think. So we are learning. Yes, we can ex uh, inspect. Oh, yeah, maybe let us uh, run a bit quickly. So GG trace inspect return uh, is uh, all the values returned by it, and you see it is a 
it has 80 rows and why 80 oh gave only one data frame corresponding to the first time it was called mm -hmm. right so we don't have all the story of all the sick times so possibly one of these yeah, so maybe I, I'm speaking a little bit, but right, we see, yes, we can look inside. Yes, we can ask about certain functions, how many times they were involved. It's interesting, right? So uh, maybe we can Maybe the six bit. is the, the x-axis that there are six uh, data points. So I think, Just... I think that we have six groups. Six groups, so, okay. Yeah, so in... In ggplot, we have a certain notion of grouping of groups and yeah. the, the data points are grouped by certain uh, aesthetics. So you see, we, we are coloring by DRV. Mm -hmm. So DRV is grouping them into red, green, and blue, but we are also uh, have, we also have those facets for different years. We have these two different years and this is also grouping. So we have three by two right. groups. And uh, basically all the green ones in the left, all the blue ones in the left and so on. And each of these six groups gets its own line passing through it. And this line passing through it was computed by StatsMove. Right. So and by call to StatsMove compute group, and I think StatsMove Compute group is just computing something in the context of a group. And we see, yeah, you could you could inspect further, like, like ask for a certain condition where you inspect it. And here, yeah, we are asking for a certain panel, which is, I guess, one of the 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 those fa those panels uh, of years, and a certain group, which is probably the grouping by the color, I'm just guessing. So yeah, you can ask for a certain context by which you are you are hoping to inspect this stats computation. So I'm skipping a little bit, right? And because we're, I think we are getting a little taste of it, but maybe we wish to see um, other up. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. Let us. We have we have fifteen minutes, so maybe let us see what capture is about, and then the high uh, part. So capture. Uh, okay, so we know that the smooth compute group returns. We know we know what it returns, but how does this return value change with different input? More generally, how does it behave under different contexts? We could answer this by making a bunch of different plots and so on, but we could also capture a call and extract it as a function. Oh, amazing, amazing. So let us see. So, right, so again, we are specifying a context where it was called and we're asking, please remember that function which was called there inside in a certain context and let us call this function capture function two, three. And then we can just call it over our own data. Why not, right? So yes, it can dive in inside and pick, pick a little out of the story as a function. You can actually apply to other data. Really nice, right? So yeah, I'm skipping a little bit. We got, we got a little taste of it and maybe not all the arguments and all the options, but we're getting a certain idea. And now hijack. Is it okay, the, the pace I'm going? Yeah, any any thoughts, any comments about anything? Mm. Yeah, so great. Once we have some understanding of how stats move compute group works, we may want to test some hypothesis about what would happen to the resulting graphical output if the method returned something else. Right, so now we do the opposite, uh, so to speak, right? We are about to replace a certain function and 
tell it to do something different if I understand correctly, right? So let us revisit our examples that we, where we captured. And what if the third group of the second panel calculated a more conservative confidence interval? Like those confidence intervals, I think these are the gray regions that represent a certain notion of uncertainty around the, the line. And, and I don't remember which method they use, but they're saying, yeah, maybe could we try to influence it? So, so it turns out that the trace hijack return can say, please use another, a modified return smooth, which is, you know, we can take the function we had and change one of the default arguments of it so that it behaves a bit differently. So it turns out that we can do that. And so, yeah, actually, let's try. Um, so Daniel, the yeah. captured the function is the function that the compute group uses? So or did I get it all wrong? Oh yeah, you, you did it right. So the captured function was defined here in the previous section in the capture. Yeah, yeah. And it defined it here. Yes, it was the function that the compute group, the compute group used in one of the six groups. So here's the capture function. Ah, okay. But it's the uh -huh. same function function in all the groups, no? So well, possibly, possibly there are certain things that change between the groups and in principle we don't know right we are okay okay this, like as a as a black box we are just learning from the outside we don't right. haven't learned what this function does so in principle it runs in a, in a context many it has many arguments passed to it and and all of them are getting certain defaults which are maybe different on the right and the left and so on. I have no idea, maybe okay. the color, right? So yeah, not obvious to me, but it could be different in any of these panels. And now we're going to say, yeah. So actually let us print this function, captured function, two, three. And so we see it is, a function that has a few arguments and most of these arguments get some default value. Uh, so if, if we call the function without any arguments, it, it would use these defaults and these defaults were injected to, to it in a certain context where it was, it was created inside ggplot and I don't understand it so much. And that's the idea, I guess, that I don't have to know all the internals. I only need to know that this specific thing was invoked there inside and it was affected by many things like the color, you see specific colored for all points in red, for example, right? That's what it says. Or all, sorry, all points have the color corresponding to R, which is, blue actually so right mm. it, it was like kind of specific in this panel and so it's it's the function invocation with the specific data of that group that we said let's capture yeah 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 exactly thank you thank you yeah and then you see one of the arguments is level and it is like 95 confidence interval which says yeah. which region we have around the line and we are going to hijack that and say yeah the level will be a much smaller number we wish to be very sorry sorry did it did it I, I just uh like was was thinking a bit uh confidence interval is the area around the line right confidence interval is the area around the line right okay okay yeah thank you so right if we just call this function it will return something. It will return this, the, the, the line and the confidence interval uh, by a certain you know, 
uh, th that's basically what it returns, right? The line and the confidence interval. X, Y, sorry, X and Y, and Y min and Y max, right? So it is a line and a confidence and interval. And uh, SEA, I believe, is standard error, but what is flipped? <laughs> With the static. Uh, and yeah, we skip this earlier. They do talk about it, and I I hoped to skip it because I I hoped it wouldn't be too important. But yeah, interesting. Whether there is some flipping. Okay. 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 We, let's keep let's keep it then. Yeah. Right. So if we just call it, then it just gets all the default arguments by but that were injected with, as we saw, all these default specific values. But now we can have, kind of call it with with uh level equals 0 0.1. So we get different numbers. And now probably the y mean and y max will be closer to y. Like it will be a narrow, narrower region. And, and now that is the hijack we're going to do. So in a hijack, we may say, yeah, here is our modified, modified return smooth. Right, that is the thing it is going to. Sorry, this is not a function anymore. It is the the data we are going to return instead of of the data we captured. And here is how we hijacked it. And oh, what? So we define it and hijack, and we see yes, one of those lines now has a narrow region of, you know, just 0 0.1 uh, confidence interval rather than 95%. Nice, so we can hijack. And, and yeah, so we have seven more minutes and what we were doing was reading some parts of the GG trace overview. Probably that was not the high level overview, but the detailed one, it looks like so. We possibly missed the main points that we would see in, in a like in a, a getting started tutorial. Maybe we can look into that uh, for a moment. And also, I encourage you all to, to look into the talk about GT Trace of uh, Jun Jun Shaw, Jun, Jun Shaw, the, the the person who who wrote it. Really a brilliant talk and, and a, a talk of the kind that I think. Um, data people would appreciate because it is all about making things into data rather than than uh, 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 objects which are hiding the details so so yeah so i think that this getting started is maybe more more of the thing we could look into so uh yeah, right. So you can ask for things like that. So we have a certain scatter plot, and you can ask for the layer after scale. So layer after scale um, tell the story at a certain stage of the computation, and it will allow you to see the influence of scale, for example, if I understand correctly. and there are certain notions of those stages that are worth looking into, uh, layer before geom and so on. And, and these stages matter if we want to implement something like ggplot the way ggplot was implemented. And, and we can learn from that. And, and so that's great that, uh, Kira, you encouraged us to look to this, I think. And, and so it was. It felt kind of partial what we we managed to do. We we learned that one could hijack a certain pipeline of functions, but but we may not learn about the most useful things we could do. And maybe the way I have a clear picture of of how I would use it to understand a certain ggplot uh, pipeline. We lost Daniel for a second. Yeah, I think so. I thought I thought it's me, but it seems it's Daniel. Yeah. 
it's always try uh, it's always hard to dig in into this like object oriented stuff mm. yeah it's um it's like you were saying i hope everything's okay probably just lost internet for a second um yeah it's 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 really interesting i mean this is the whole thing that comes up all the time in the closure data ecosystem or whatever it's like there's just a different way of thinking about how data flows through a program or a pipeline compared to um, the object oriented approaches. Like in Python or R, you start with a thing and then you just keep like changing it and mutating it. And then you never exactly really know what state it's in. Um, and then you can't, and you also can't really like go back a step and redo it. Whereas yeah, like in closure, it's, it's like you're passing, you're just you start with, like you're saying, like exactly, input, exactly. output, input, output. And every time you have an output, it's a new input to the next step, but it's it's very transparent. It's very um, declarative. Can, can hey, you, Daniel. Have you yeah. ever tried, uh, Kira, have you ever tried Polars, uh, the, like Rust and the Python uh, data frame <laughs> library? I, th I think it's kind of have this functional approach. Yeah. That could, could be, yeah, uh, definitely. Could be yeah. useful to study. The people I work with who do Python stuff, um, I think Polars is like a way better fit. Not to diss Pandas. Obviously, Pandas is a great library that is super useful for a lot of people. But um, a lot of the problems that that people run into with Pandas are solved by Polars. And I think it handles bigger data sets quite a bit better, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, but, no, it's, in Pandas, you just have to do it manually, like specifying chunks. Uh, doing right. like parallel computing using Python map, uh, how it is called, pool map, and uh, Polars just comes out of the box. But the general approach, it, it's functional. Yeah, so yeah. you just pass the data and you always know what, what's going on. Yeah, that's really cool. One of that's I want to write a blog post about comparing um, Polars and dplyr and, or however you pronounce it, and tablecloth. Um, like side by side, I think it would be really cool. Yeah, yeah, because because I think uh, I think the uh, creator of Polars was inspired by Tibo uh, from Tidyverse, mm. and he right. wrote this library to compare. And uh, I think his earliest blog post was that he almost got to the speed of the Tibo, but now I think it's like the, right. the speed of Polars is like it's most speedy data frame library, even like faster than Tibo. Yeah, well, and that's that's the thing I think, and that's what brings some people to Closure is like people who have big data sets to work with, because Closure is like on the JVM is like orders of magnitude faster than than Python and R. So it's like usually it doesn't matter because the the data sets you're working with are are small enough. But for people who have um, like more intense, like computationally intensive things to do, some of the people we've met in this like group or whatever. Um, came for that reason because because tablecloth is like really really fast, and that's that's most of like Chris Nuremberger's work because he's done a lot of work, um, like super hyper optimizing numeric computations on the JVM, and so um, he does a lot of like really low level um, implementations and like optimizations to make working with columnar data in Closure really fast. Yeah, and and, and it is lazy if I'm not mistaken, exactly. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can load any size data set, it doesn't matter. And then you can do things with it that might use otherwise require, like if you were just going to do it in Pandas or whatever, it would take, you know, the whole memory amount, like you need the amount of memory, the size of your data set, but with tablecloth and or technical data set, everything is, is lazy and, and like just in time kind of approach. So it's much more efficient yeah. with memory. Yeah. Yeah. I think this like a modern approach everywhere, like with Polars and DuckDB and Tablecloth. Uh, right. Yeah, and uh, that's why they use using DuckDB as well. I mean, right. Chris Nurmick. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, sorry for stopping you and sorry for disappearing. Uh, some connection no, no, no. problem. Yeah, so, so maybe let us conclude the GG plot path and then we can talk about anything after some people may need to leave in a moment. So, so we had a session about GG trace. And we are wondering about where we should continue. We will discuss it in the chat, in the Zulip chat. And I'll mention all of you so that you can comment there and we can think about where we're going. And possibly we will learn ggtrace offline and kind of continue with it offline after this little taste and continue through the book. 
or any other thought you have. So please let us think, right? Please let us think about where we go and what would actually help us build our grammar, which is eventually our goal. And any, any comment before I stop the recording? Anything about the topic of today? So, and then I'll stop the recording and we can talk about anything else. Yeah, thank you so much. I think, yeah, just the last question. If anybody is aware if there are actually some functional functional style uh, visualization libraries, because I believe there are not. All we have is what, what do you mean by functional style? Uh, like, Sorry. I mean, what we are now digging with is we're trying to understand how the data goes through the ggplot and uh, yeah, all the other libraries, visualization libraries. But there, I think there are no libraries that do it in a functional way, just passing the data openly. It's it's all object oriented. Am I right? For data visualization so, currently? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's, yeah, this is another one I want to do, like a roundup of the current data viz options. But yeah, there, there are a few. So Vega and Vega Lite are based loosely on the grammar of graphics, um, like philosophy. So they take just declarative JSON. Um, data structures and then output a graph. So yeah, it depends what you mean by functional, but they might fall under that um, group. And then there are some like- But like uh, don't, don't they have, uh, don't they have uh, like D3GS under the hood? Yes, but the, the, the UI is like declarative and arguably functional, but I know what you mean, it's like, but at the end of the day too, like like data visualization is inherently stateful. Like you have, because like you, the whole point of the viz is to, to side effect in the real world or whatever, right? Like, so it's like the idea is to constrain the side effects to the edges of the system. So it's like you, the visualization part itself would be pure or functional or whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're trying to create like a graphic, like a visual, a visual thing on a screen that didn't exist before it's like that's a side effect you have to at some point render it to the browser so you have to influence the outside world like the world outside your program so it's like yeah so d3 is like i guess technically not functional if you think of it in that sense depends what you mean by functional or whatever but um so yeah, yeah. i mean it, it have the classes and the state inside the classes but i was thinking if it's right. possible like to to make a library that uh, like in closure, we have at atoms, which like we, we put state in a different place and maybe that is, will be possible someday right. just to have a state in a different place. Right. So ggplot is yeah. about, it is about pure data transformations, except for the plotting part. And the R people, they would call it functional. Yes, it is object oriented, but for the R culture, being object oriented is part of the story. Yeah, it, it is. It is another aspect whether it is object oriented or not. Right? We closure people, we avoid object orientation, but it is like in a way a reasonably harmless object oriented system because you don't have those stateful objects in in the in the pure data transformations that create the plot specification. Yes, eventually you, you draw on a canvas and that part is imperative and, and yeah, it is, but it is not about the way you express data visualizations. And um, the R people, they, they do have different flavors of this. So you see here, they use the plus operator and later they prefer functional pipelines like you do an enclosure with a threading macro and then they would call that more of, of a functional culture. It is just a way of expression, but that's the new approach. And they have this ggviz package, which is going that way of, you know, pipelines. And ggviz is also possibly interesting for us. But all of these, for them, you know, as far as, far as I understand, it is it's about, sorry, not for them. It is about pure data transformations, right? Yes, the implementation is about objects and I'm kind of intimidated, but that's part of the story. Does it make sense? Sorry for, for kind of being opinionated about it. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally, totally. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah and maybe we don't, maybe we wish to have it, another experience. Maybe we don't want it to hide 
the internals. Maybe that's for us closure. Yeah, people. yeah, exactly. What well, that was I was thinking too, because in closure we have atoms where we can put state in, and maybe they could be a library that uh, just stores state somewhere else, and it's like uh, it's accessible and it's clear, and then we have all that transformation functions, and finally the visualization. But it's just a rough idea. Yeah, and, and maybe I think that is by Kira, the fact that you mentioned Vega and Vega Lite makes sense so much because these are not hiding, right? They just show up the whole spec without, you know, calling these functions that return whatever we don't see, right? And maybe for us closure people, that's the point, having those things which are just data, which are just Daniel, data. Yeah. Th those functions, you mean like the geom and the geom point, geom smooth, all that, you mean? Yeah. Or what? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, they return objects, but they are pure data transformations. These objects do not change inside in no in normal use, as far as I understand. Um. Yeah. Right. So again, like if 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 we return to Haskell, they, could we call them like a data class? Data classes more than a regular. Object-oriented classes. Do you get my question? Would you like to to tell us what that means? Uh, like, I mean, uh, no, I, I think this question needs a bit more thinking. So let, 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 let's skip it for now. Yeah. Yeah, in any way, so, sorry for, for kind of holding on to those concepts, but I think you are so right that we want something that feels like Vega in a way that is, you know, just about specifying a data structure, I believe. Is, is that what is that where we're going? I, I'm not sure, right? There are a few thoughts here, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, any... Uh, any uh, thoughts about, um, yeah, so sh should, we, should we say goodbye to the recording and then go back to where I stopped you a few minutes earlier? Yeah, so um, we'll say goodbye to the recording and see you on the next time. We'll chat in Zulip and keep going. <laughs>